Welcome to this webinar, which is UAC and Public Art Fund take on the top public art projects of 2017. My name is Natasha Smith. I'm UAC Principal and Senior Curator, and I head up our curatorial team globally. We're based in Australia and China predominantly, and also have hubs in the Middle East um, and also in Southeast Asia. Um, my background is in the curation of art for public space predominantly and has been focused in that area for the past 10 years. And it is my great honor every day to work with fabulous artists and wonderful creative people. So it's lovely to uh, host a webinar like this and talk to you about these kinds of things. Um, today, as your host, it is my great pleasure to also be able to share this conversation with Nicholas Bone, who is director and chief curator of the Public Art Fund in New York. Um, Nicholas, it is just fantastic to have you with us. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. And um, it is a first time that you've done this sort of thing with us, so it's a real, real honor. First time we've met. <laughs> <laughs> it is the first time we've met, and today we're here in um, Public Art Fund's fantastic headquarters in New York City. So if you hear the ambient noise of the bell chiming or the fire engines going past, you'll know where we are. So because you joined the Public Art Fund as Director and Chief Curator in 2009 and this is a continuation of a stellar curatorial career previously of course as well, beginning in Australia, um, which is UAC Roots as well, um, working with Caldor Art Project. You work every day with leading edge international artists and I think most notably um, this year, past having worked with the world-renowned artist I went away for a major project that went all across New York City to known as Good Senses Make Good Neighbours. And we'll actually talk a little bit more about that project today, which is fantastic. And um, thank you also to your wonderful curatorial team who have, in the background, um, helped to curate this list of projects that we're speaking about today, along with UAC's fabulous team as well. All right, so officially the top public art project of 2017. So this is just a little bit of a teaser slide. Hopefully to whet your appetite, you can see what's coming up. Um, we have 12 projects that we feel are really outstanding that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and we also have five projects that we've got some thoughts around that we're also interested in. We're going to put an honorable merit into those and I'll speak about those right at the end. Um, before we do delve into each project, and um, speaking more depth. Nicholas and I did want to frame up for you, I guess, the context for us in terms of how we approach making a selection like this. It's been a very fun exercise to think about this. Thank you for inviting me to do that. Recognizing, of course, that, you know, I, I still have a very subjective view. Um, there are a lot of things that I didn't get to see or experience firsthand, um, and a lot of things that are probably amazing that I didn't even know about. So, you know, I think it's important to recognize that this is a very subjective process. Um, and of course, you know, we didn't want to make it um, sort of full of public art on projects, though we have included a couple that we felt, um, you know, were very strong projects but which also reflect on some of the key themes that emerged in looking at a number of projects as, as sort of trends that feel like they're important uh, to the field right now. So, uh, so we were keen to, to kind of look as broadly as possible to think about works that have, uh, on their own terms, a strong impact, but also relate to some of these broader themes that we've identified. Mm, absolutely. And um, on the, the note of, um, I guess, where we were looking and, and stepping outside, as you say, of your world and mm -hmm. looking globally, um, I think that's the key fact. We were looking really globally. Last year was a particular year in terms of public art. And um, I think that affects where we look as well. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, it was a tumultuous year for the world yeah. and for the United States. Um, and it's inevitable that those sort of issues and conflicts and challenges are things that artists are going to be thinking 
thinking about and absorbing and reflecting in their work, uh, we saw also those that kind of rare moment where you know, most of sculpture project, which happens every 10 years, uh, documenta, which happens every five years, uh, as well as a number of kind of major biennials and, and you know important international shows all occurred. So uh, I think there were a lot of opportunities to see interesting art with interesting curatorial perspectives, uh, and and that certainly you know provided uh, a great basis for us to think about this. I guess you touched a little bit before on themes and trends that we noticed, mm -hmm. and that I think in a way um, you know stood out for us, and then we began to curate this list. With that in mind, creating a bit of a journey through those um, threads and trends. The interest in socially engaged and politically engaged work has really increased. And obviously, there have been a, a lot of artists working in those domains for a long time, uh, but I think there's been a, a significant increase in institutional support and interest. Uh, for that kind of work, and we certainly saw, you know, the focus of a number of exhibitions there, um, as well as, of course, probably more artists uh, being perhaps more uh, assertive and have politicized themselves in ways that they hadn't been before. Yeah. Certainly, that has been a, a kind of major focus and, and theme that we see in a lot of important work through the year. And, and I think the mining of history uh, has, has been very important too. Sometimes it's actually in relation to that social and political content because of that impulse to sort of look back at precedents or rediscover kind of activist moments or works that then inform current dialogue or that seem to have a renewed relevance to what I was thinking about now, just as historical forms like the monument also sort of open themselves to a kind of you know, reinterrogation, rethinking, reinvention. And we've seen that a number of times as well. Monuments are uh, embodiments of power in a traditional sense. So, of course, they're right for playing with. You know, we sort of looked at a number of works um, that that I, I think, you know, we're talking about in the context of sites of disruption. Uh, and I think that term, uh, we really wanted to suggest uh, the way sites, uh, particularly landscape, um, are uh, often the, the sort of context for interventions by artists that can make us rethink the nature of those locations. And in that sense, um, disrupt our expectations um, and perhaps also uh, challenge or, or um, evoke a sense of different layers experientially so that you can experience those works in a specific site, you can experience them um, online. Uh, you can experience a, a reimagining of a kind of landscape or a site through virtual reality or different platforms that um, sort of disrupt the sense of, of a simple static location. Just really quickly, I wanted to note that we had a key criteria. I guess these are kind of things that the art has to do or not do. So the work has to be installed in 2017. They have to be open to the public and they have to be free to view. Um, and the selection of works that we've come up with is very open. We looked at all mediums, we looked at all scales. Um, we didn't limit ourselves in, in that area. So finally, we're going to embark into the list without further ado. Um, we did want to just note that the projects are not in an order of merit but rather reflect our curated approach to, I guess, um, a reaction to some of those thematic links that we found. So 
jumping straight in, um, Nicholas, did you want to talk a bit about this project? Sure. I mean, Pierre Hui was commissioned um, to do a, a major installation for the Minister Sculpture Project. Um, the Minister Sculpture Project that we mentioned, a uh, really extraordinary and, and now uh, sort of very famous exhibition where the city of Münster in Germany uh, plans for 10 years um, on presenting commissions by works of art throughout this sort of wonderful uh, sort of German Baroque town. Um, and you can walk around uh, from installation to installation and literally the city sort of turns itself over to public art. And uh, in all of its kind of iterations and forms, and, and so <clears throat> that was uh, that was fascinating to see. And Week was one of the, I think, most successful and memorable installations um, that was created for uh, for the exhibition. Should we look at some of the? Yeah, and and you saw this in person, which I think is yeah. really nice to yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, this was something that you experienced. Yeah. This was a, a work that was installed in a disused ice rink. Um, <clears throat> and you walked inside this space to find that uh, the subgrade level had been excavated, that the concrete floor that had once been the skating rink had been sort of cut away and dug into. And you see here people. Of standing around and, and actually you could walk down into this sort of valley that had been created uh, amidst these elements and, um, and you would discover strange objects, uh, interesting forms, um, works that relate to other um, sort of previous works of, of peers, um, and and uh, and different elements like a virtual element that you, there was a, an app that you could download, uh, which also sort of added a layer of experience to the work. These ceiling uh, skylights would open and close periodically, kind of opening the space um, to you know to the sun to the air. Um, and it was a uh, it was a very mysterious kind of experience. Um, it it felt like uh, you really were. Um, uh, of course, you know, it might have evoked the history of land art and those kinds of, of major excavation projects. But it also felt as if it was somehow conceived by a completely alien logic and somehow was a dystopian experience as well, where nature and man were in this kind of strange, uneasy relationship. And you know, this really starts us off on that thread of science of disruption, which is really interesting. I mean, I think there are a lot of threads in this particular work um, that, you know, are picked up with particularly that idea of disruption. And, and I think just some of the, the detail in this work is incredible. You know, when you read about it, there were there were bees, there were cancer cells, there was organic um, you know, moths and things growing and it's really bizarre and fascinating. I think there was a peacock. Um, you know, oh, and they yeah, no, and basically there was a peacock. So I thought that was too bad that this is the home of the peacock. Um, and the augmented reality component um, was actually masking the growth and change of the cancer cells. So that was kind of interesting. So just a really bizarre project and, and from your experience now it can be really quite incredible. Um, so I guess linking with the notion of flat disruption, um, moving from this fabulous project into our next work, um, there's an interesting linkage but in a very different way. So Doug Aitken, obviously a US based artist um, and still living in the US, did an amazing project. Um, last year for the Desert X Biennale in the Coachella Valley in California. Um, this is one of the most visually captivating works of 
last year and it, for me was an absolute standout and a favourite, um, both conceptually and aesthetically. The work entitled Mirage recreates a ranch style suburban American house in a replica, which both reflects and absorbs the landscape that it surrounds. And I think this is the crux of that disruption notion, you know. It's, Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is the work that sits at the edge of kind of suburban sprawl where it hits the, um, the valley and you've got this kind of uneasy point between landscape and, um, you know, man-made housing. And here this work is kind of embodying both of those elements and it's disrupting that break. It's literally reflecting out sort of metaphorically what's happening around it. Um, so, you know, conceptually an absolute masterpiece and visually just so incredibly engaging and beautiful. Um, and it was very, very popular. Um, there was interest in the piece remaining in the site after the Biennale. Um, I believe that Aitken applied to the council to retain it and they rejected that and then he reappealed as well. So interesting kind of journey and there was a lot of interest both to and for it in the community. Some people were strongly opposed to it being retained and others really, really wanted to see the work retained. So um, definitely yeah. something that got people reacting. Right. I mean, yeah, it was an interesting piece to me because Doug is, um, of course, very well known for his hero work and sort of image making. Um, but here he is, in a sense, sort of dissolving the architecture and turning it into a screen so that it becomes a kind of live image uh, that both dissolves the bricks and mortar of the form. Um, and at the same time creates this sort of virtual experience. Uh, so, so a really interesting, um, I think, you know, addition to his own work as well. And that's such a beautiful analogy of the screen versus the physical. Okay, and next up we have another artist that was exhibiting as part of the Desert X Biennale. So you can see here from our uh, Claiming that we were very inspired by this um, dinner. This is Claudia Comte, um, and this work is curves and zigzags. Claudia is a Swiss born artist based in Germany. Um, this work, I think, is just such an incredible, I guess, ode to, you know, op art, and it's just so beautiful in its um, aesthetic. So we dive in and just have a look. Again, it's sitting in that incredible Coachella landscape and holding its own, not dwarfed at all by the space, um, if anything, dazzling and bright. Um, it becomes almost like a, a mirage, I guess in a way, not dissimilar to what we've seen with Aitken's work, but in a, in a much more sort of um, loud and, and expressive sense, but it is playing with your view of the landscape, playing with your um, perceptions, I guess. Really interesting, but I, I liken it to a mirage in the desert. It's, it's really interesting, um, and I think you know this is a work that again is kind of disrupting um, the space very effectively, um, and it's just such a beautiful minimalist pop art expression. You know, you see that sort of ode to soft wit um, coming through, just absolutely divine. Now, this piece you didn't see it in the desert, but you did see this in another context. Um, I know, and I'm not aware of it having been in another context, oh, okay. but, um, but I, I know Claudia's you work know, very well, and yeah. I've done other work with her, public art, which has done other work yeah. with her. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, if we go to the next slide, it will get, um, there's another slide where you can see uh, the whole image of the piece. Um, I think she's a you know, extraordinary artist who's working in a number of different mediums, including these kind of hybrid sculptural wall painting forms. Um, and, and of course, this contrast with the landscape 
Nicole Eisenman uh, fascinating artist who's really sort of risen to prominence as a painter, but whose interest in sculpture has been growing enormously uh, in recent years. And this was a really reviewer kind of performance of you know her first kind of major sculptural installation in Europe. Once again, uh, done for the Minister of Sculpture Project, uh, work called the Sketch for a Fountain, truthfully, um, which uh, uh, you know is a sort of interestingly tentative title, um, which perhaps suggests how taking on a classical uh, kind of uh, genre, the idea of a of a public sculpt, a public uh, fountain with figurative sculptures, but Eisenman kind of taking that classical genre and then really messing with it, really playing with it in very uh, interesting ways that uh, I thought were were really uh, very powerful and successful. The um, images that she presented. Um, were not the uh, the kind of uh, classical figures that we would expect. Um, should we go back yeah, to sort of a bigger view of the whole piece? Um, yeah, um, I mean, you can see that the, the uh, fountain, uh, the jets of water are coming out of you know the legs of a figure or a frog sitting on the back of you know, another figure, uh, another of the uh, figures is sort of lying on the ground holding a beer can. You know, these are not the allegorical sort of, um, you know, heroic figures of classical fountain century. They are uh, much more sort of, um, uh, much more in a way sort of plain with those expectations of what the kind of heroic bronze or the plastic figure should look like. Um, there was sort of gender ambiguity. Um, yeah. There was, there was uh, a, you know, real sense of play with um, with form, figure, gender, um, and I mean, I think it was very successfully done. It was whimsical. It was playful. It was Kind of startling and beautiful in its location. Um, and it became controversial as well because it also then um, was vandalized uh, and it's a really hateful, uh, you know, sort of vandalism of the work took place. So I think, you know, that has also been a motif this year that um, this. Sort of politically charged moment has brought out, you know, both an interest in in sort of artists taking a stand and, and pushing and uh, having their own sort of activist content, um, but of course, you know, the voices of uh, of, of sort of um, you know of hate and reaction, also feeling entitled and empowered to express themselves. And I think that's a really nice straightforward to move into some of the projects that are coming up as well because, you know, I think as we move through some of these next projects, we're starting to see a lot of political engagement as a sort of key theme mm -hmm. coming through, underpinning the work or, you know, driving the content and the inspiration. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about this one as well? Sure. Um, this is a work that uh, is by a really interesting uh, sort of emerging South African artist, um, Deneo Sishi Pape. Um, I was not lucky enough to see this work, which was done in the Shahjah Biennial. Um, I, I didn't see it firsthand, though I did see Deneo's work in other exhibitions that uh, I thought were very powerful. And I heard a lot about this installation that she'd done in Sharjah, which did win one of the uh, prizes in the biennial. Um, and 
and you see here she created sort of a series of installations, a lot of them made with modular components, sort of bricks of earth that were round or packed, um, that were drawn from different locations, mixed together with all kinds of very good evocative, um, very highly textured materials, um, all of them evoking a kind of you know, personal language and mythology and a sense of restoring to the artwork a kind of mythic dimension and doing so in a way that, that felt sort of intimate and human within the sort of context of a, of a big Biennale. Yeah. Yeah, there's a sense of, I think, ritual to his work and And there's a strong activist element to her work too that's yeah. sort of woven in subtly um, that, you know, is, is nevertheless, I think, important. Even the idea of how Earth yeah. represents land, represents a place, and ownership and history. All of those, you know, really important themes in, of course, it's a post colonial political context. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, not only is this work really outstanding, but I think it's interesting to note the quality of the, the Sharjah Biennale as well. A few more images there, and on to our next project. So, here was Hay. This was um, an artist who developed a project for Documenta, which we spoke about a little bit earlier when we introduced the project um, as being another key inspiration point for us. From 2017, of course, something that only happens every five years. Um, so very exciting to see that last year. Um, he was hey with one of the standouts for me. Um, one of our senior curators from UAP uh, visited Documenta, and this in particular was their favourite um, and their nomination for our list, which is fabulous. I think what's so beautiful about this piece is the intimacy of it. I mean, essentially, this is a work that's connecting into um, political engagement as one of those key threads, and also, um, I think, social engagement as well. Um, basically, it's composed of these ceramic pipes, and these are a reference to something in the artist's past. So, um, you know, when he was a refugee and traveling through the land, he would have to hide in these pipes of sleep in these old pipes that were used for canalization. So I think it's a really interesting personal reference to drawing out a story about being a refugee and going through that um, experience. And in the spine of this work for um, Documenta in Kassel in Germany, he actually wanted the work to be an Airbnb location, um, but he wasn't able to make that happen, which is a bit of a shame. But when the work was produced, um, it was produced in partnership with a, a graduate um, studies course within the city, and the students that helped install the work did actually stay overnight. overnight. So he still got that connection to the, the sense of being this kind of transient home. But I think what stood out um, is that intimacy quality. When you look into each of these you know, beautiful um, pipes, there are just all these lovely effects and personal moments and they're, they're like little cops and beds and um, it's really just very engaging and, and sensitive and beautiful and there's an attention to detail which you know very different um, but like we saw with Nicole's work you know just that level of detail really does add an incredible um, you know, interest uh, to the viewer and something very very engaging. And also that um, opportunity uh, as somebody visiting a major art mm -hmm. uh, exhibition to, uh, in a sense, identify with or project what the experience of this kind of, um, you know, beautifully intimate, but also very, um, you know, incredibly tiny, confined space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, you know, the refugee experience also speaks to and having to sort of 
have your life be completely mobile that you can pick it up and, and sort of go with it. Yeah. yeah. And I think treating that whole concept with a, a sort of reverence as well, which is quite lovely. Um, just see the, the thought and the placement of the belongings within each little tube. They become like a, a gallery within themselves. And I think there's, there's a lovely reverence to that, even though it's very simple material. And it's clearly, you know, talking to the transient, which is the reality. There's also this um, lovely sense of care and consideration applied to each of those little environments, which is very beautiful. Um, next up, well, I think this is a project that you have to talk about. <laughs> So yes, I mean, full disclosure, I, I'm the curator of this project, so uh, a little bit of hunt hard to include it, but um, uh, I do think uh, certainly we were incredibly proud of this exhibition, uh, which really was a sort of high point of our 40th anniversary. Um, and I think it, it certainly um, was of a scale and impact that sort of makes it a, a contender for a discussion about important public art projects of, of the past year. Um, I think, you know, it was important to Public Art Fund and to Ai Weiwei that the exhibition really uh, used the city of New York as a platform, that it not only be in Manhattan, but that it really reach out to uh, other locations. We, in fact, have work in all five of the boroughs. Um, of course, in very prominent civic locations like Washington Square, the Washington Square Monument, um, but also in, uh, you know, bus shelters in downtown Brooklyn or the Unisphere in Queens, um, here where at the entrance to Central Park, um, the exhibition was titled Good Fences Make Good Neighbors. Uh, it was very much coming out of Weiwei's experience of uh, the refugee crisis, the international crisis that's still well underway, um, that he has spent a lot of time kind of working on, thinking about um, visiting refugee camps, border sites, and uh, making a feature film. Um, and you know, when I invited him to think about a project for New York City, uh, he wanted to take this motif of the fence and think of a way to elaborate that as a sculptural form in different iterations that would connect with the infrastructure of the city in, a, in an inventive way. Um, but that would not be an impediment and an annoyance. Um, and I think, in a way, the brilliance of, of Weiwei's work is that uh, he is able to take an issue as um, tough and confronting as the divisions between people, you know, borders, fences, separation, and turn that into an immersive, interactive, experiential, you know, work of art that is distributed all around the city that takes the form of banners. There were 200, you know, portraits of refugees and immigrants. There were over 100 bus shelter um, images taken from refugee camps around the world, as well as the fences that were sort of surrounding the, the bus shelter. Can go back to yeah. that, um, to the previous. Yeah, you see here this kind of uh, fence that encloses the bus shelter, but with a seat built into it, so that it actually was kind of playing with the idea of street furniture as well as the, the sculpture, and then using the space normally for advertising with all of these different images of, you know, the plot of of refugees. Um, so it was an exhibition that really used a lot of different materials, formats, locations to create what I think was a, a really extraordinary exhibition. It, it really is exquisite and I 
think they deal with very difficult subjects and make them incredibly accessible, I think, to the broader public. And, you know, something it's very beautiful in these different forms and also very functional, you know. Yeah. You know truly, as someone outside of public art, I'm truly exceptional. Well, and of course, UAP played a great role fabricating yeah. Yeah. the gilded cage yeah. and the Washington Square yeah. Arts. So that was a, a wonderful partnership uh, between us as well. Next up, um, very different kind of project, but definitely continuing that idea, I think, of political engagement again, and also the notion of the re, I guess, reuse or reimagining or reinventing of the monument. You know, this is a very interesting work. Um, which came out of Documenta. Nicholas, do you want to talk a little bit about this one as well? This is the sort of, you know, town, well, one of the kind of town squares in downtown castle. Um, and Aguibe uh, took this um, sort of image of the uh, Egyptian obelisk, one of the most sort of, you know, uh, literally historic yeah. forms of public art um, and use that to inscribe uh, a very simple but very potent message. Perhaps a good next slide might give us some detail there where you can see that um, on each of the four sides of the column, um, the same phrase in four different languages inscribed, gilded, um, a quote from the Bible, in fact, uh, I was a stranger and you took me in. Now, of course, Germany has really played a, a key role in Europe grappling with the refugee crisis. Um, and it, it's obviously a, a huge issue globally. Um, and this was a sort of wonderfully distilled simple but very powerful uh, expression of, of sort of this, this, you know, notion of generosity and of basic human values and of um, sort of seeing uh, the, the commonality and the shared humanity between people of different races, of different countries, of different languages. And this is one of the much loved pieces, I think, mm -hmm. from the whole event. And I think there's actually currently a, a discussion about trying to retain this work, which is very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, certainly it was it was very well followed in social media and, and much loved from the kind of conversations going on. There was also negative context um, from some of the local um, politicians, which is interesting, but um, there was also a lot of positive feedback. Next up, continuing that same concept, I guess, of the monument essentially um, being used or leveraged or reinvented, um, you know, this comes to a bit more of a, I don't want to use the word playful, but a, a very political project. Um, Philip Roosh, who heads up the Centre for Political Beauty, um, put this project together. And I think for us, this stood out as um, just a really interesting work because it really is art as activism in perhaps its purest form. So, this is a creative group, the Centre for Political Beauty. They see themselves as artists and as activists, and they put these sort of guerrilla installations, works, and performances together. This piece was put together as an exact or close to exact miniature replica of the Lincoln Holocaust Memorial, obviously very, very famous, um, and located in a property outside a right-wing alternative for Germany leader um, outside his home. So a really uh, strong political message, and it was a reaction to something that that politician had said. Um, which is, you know, very bold, very interesting, and for the piece to actually be placed next to his home, they have to basically rent a basic block. Um, there was a lot of preparation and planning, and um, this is the work here, you know, quite 
banal, quite crude in terms of a replica, but um, you know, unmistakably a replica and a reference to the memorial. So, a you know, really interesting piece. And you can see some of the activists from the group standing in front of the work. Um, needless to say, the uh, neighbour, the politician in question, was not very impressed <laughs> and has tried to have it removed, but um, it's still stood strong and, and did its job and got the message out. So I think, you know, different people have different reactions to this kind of work, but I think it's very interesting and shows the role, the power that an artist have, and I guess highlights that artists are being political with their work at the moment, which is really interesting. So next up we have um, Marta Minuin's work. Marta's an Argentinian artist. Um, she did a piece as part of a uh, documentary as well. So this was possibly one of the largest works um, that we saw coming out of Document 14. Um, she collaborated with members of the public and the University of Castle to put the work together and essentially constructed a replica of the Parthenon entirely out of books. And these books were um, essentially from a list of works that are um, prohibited titles from around the world. So it was a reference to the former Nazi book burning site in Castle. So again, very politically engaged work, but also that thread of the monument coming back in, you know, here she literally is recreating um, you know, the Parthenon, which is an iconic monument in its own right, um, historical piece. So you can see the columns and and the sort of um, outline of the building is constructed out of these books wrapped up in these sort of uh, plastic brick-like bundles, and um, members of the public could come and line up and receive a book at random, a random selection of a book from the collection, which had a lovely little kind of participatory element within the work. But they could contribute those. They could also contribute right. them. Oh. Yes. Um, quite, quite uh, striking in its sheer scale. Um, and a piece from documents that was also, I think, strongly followed and expressed in social media. Right. And interestingly, uh, an, an older piece. Yes. Yeah. So this is a work that had been originally created in Buenos Aires. Yeah. Um, and, and so <laughs> an opportunity for an artist to sort of recreate a work that had happened sort of many years ago, perhaps it wasn't something many of us were aware of, I yeah. certainly wasn't. So I think that um, also interest in, in sort of mining the history of recent art that, that wasn't a part of the, you know, the canon, um, but, you know, giving it a platform and, and uh, an opportunity for people to sort of experience that in a different way, in a different context. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And next up, I'll hand over to you for this one. Can sure. You tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, um, Anri Sala, uh, I think, a, a really fascinating artist um, who has worked um, in, in a number of different ways, different mediums. Um, a lot of his work brings together sound and image, uh, and he's, he's created, you know, installations uh, in a number of different locations uh, that have been in, immersive, um, interactive to some extent, uh, and also respond in very particular ways to different locations. Um, this is a, a piece um, called The Last Resort, which was installed uh, in, in Sydney um, in, in this uh, the wonderful location on Observatory Hill, a very historic uh, part of, of Sydney. Um, and I think in, in doing it, Sala was interested in um, also uh, disrupting this site in the sense of um, sort of using it as, as a metaphor that 
would allow people to uh, experience or project back to different moments in time to think back to uh, the sort of European settlement or European discovery and the settlement of Australia, um, the relationship between the indigenous people and uh, the, the colonizers, the British that were arriving to think at the same time of the values of the enlightenment of the great works of Western uh, literature and music that were being created at that time, and in particular, uh, a Mozart piece, which was, um, which he sort of appropriated and scored according to the, um, uh, the wind direction that had been charted in all the sea logs when they were in, in, Exactly, yeah. on sort of this sort of mariners that were uh, you know sailing into Sydney. So um, so it was this wonderful, completely unexpected sort of collision of these different logics from different periods and different locations, creating from what you know one of the most famous sort of Mozart's uh, creations into something that became this very different um, sound experience that maybe had echoes of, of these different kinds of moments and experiences. Yeah, and um, I saw this work firsthand, and the sound element is very compelling. And I think it's the one thing it's hard to imagine when you're just seeing a series of lines that are filled with that noise. But uh, a lot of people came and just laid down um, on the deck of, of the um, rotunda and, and just looked up and distance and it was quite mesmerizing and, and the drums were sort of reflected to make catch it up as they mentioned. Um, but yeah, certainly that kind of framing of, of history and landscape and connection to the harbour is very, very beautiful. And because this is the um, Calder Art Project. Yes, um, yes. One of the great innovators in the Australian yeah. um, public art realm for the last 40 years. Absolutely, and you know, in our last year's review, one of the Project projects was an absolute yeah. highlight, Johnson Jones work. So um, fantastic to see them in the lineup again. Um, next up, this one, did you want to talk a little bit Nicholas, about this is what Sure. Um, and we're getting short on time. Yeah, so, we'll have to speed um, up. We'll do the fast. So, so um, Liz, a uh, brilliant young American artist, uh, Boston born, based now in LA. Um, and this again was a, a commission that we, uh, we did for the 40th anniversary. Um, but again, was I think really uh, an outstanding project and something that felt like it really um, sort of amplified the themes that we're talking about in, in this group of projects. Liz um, made this work for Doris Street and Plaza, which is on the corner of Fifth Avenue at the entrance to Central Park. And she really wanted to relate to that site was fascinated by the Gilded Age, that 19th century moment of uh, the 1%, or yeah. probably the 0.1%, um, where you know, great luxury ostentation, wealth was the preserve of a tiny minority but incredibly privileged, and who showed it off with very lavish interiors, with great ballrooms, uh, and parties for the sort of, you know, the, their debutantes. So, so Liz um, researched a particular location that's since been demolished and then created her own version of a ballroom that um, instead of being the preserve of this elite, became a sort of public space. And using these cast concrete uh, furniture forms, the archways uh, kind of suggested the ghost of uh, an architectural space and really transformed that whole plaza into what she called the open house. And the use of material is so beautiful and it's contrast to the organization, I think, the banality of the concrete, but it, it's gorgeous. And, and I think the interactivity of this work is lovely. You know, right. people are literally in 
invite us to, to sit and enjoy and connect and you can see everyone, you know, hanging out and taking their selfies and, you know, there's a lovely sort of mm -hmm. public um, tone to it, but as you say, bringing that sort of indoors, outdoors and, yeah, um, absolutely gorgeous. And of course, the public arts and projects are so beautiful. And now, because we are getting time on time, we would love to just do a couple of questions at the end. I'm just going to very quickly skip through these honourable mentions. We did want to note uh, Ryoji Ikeda's work. Ryoji is a Japanese-based, uh, born artist, very French-based, and he produced this incredible piece with um, car enthusiasts outside, um, or very near to the Guggenheim. Um, this work uh, essentially requires the car owners with their stereos to perform a music piece in coordination. So it was a big undertaking um, and really quite a fun piece. And you could sort of um, imagine that for that um, performance, it would be incredibly engaging. Um, JR was another honorable mention for his Picnic at the Border. Again, a piece that I think was tapping into our theme of very much uh, political engagement um, and also, you know, social engagement. Um, he essentially created a giant picnic table at the US-Mexico border. It was an absolute direct response to Trump and um, his ideas about building a wall. And essentially, JR invited people to come and share a lunch across the border, um, share a common dialogue, which is, you know, just a beautiful concept. Um, and the work had these striking graphics and true sort of JR street art. Um, style and this child that speeches was invited to come to the dinner. Um, Asad Rafa was another honourable mention. This is a piece um, in Milan um, in Italy. This work stood out to us for its playful nature and again that kind of idea of I guess disrupting a location or you know um, changing the way that you think about a space essentially. Um, this work quite literally took over a historic church and turned it into a tennis court. Um, and the idea is that people could come in and um, apply to play a game within space. Um, and it was conversation enacted in a different dialogue, essentially. Um, but they're surrounded by the old frescoes and sculptures of the church, which is just really beautiful. And it stood out to us as something different and fun and engaging. Um, and last up, Erwin Revel, we wanted to do an honourable mention for his piece, which was um, produced between Madison Square Art and also UAP. Um, this piece, White Out, was um, installed in Madison Square Park. It's still actually on show. And um, it's just a beautiful LED-based program work that takes cues from uh, the weather, from the wind, from the natural environment, which affects the lighting um, system and create a beautiful pattern that reacts across the entire park. And um, the little lights hover just above the ground. And when we have the, or you guys have the incredible snowfalls you had not that long ago, um, it's just where it's quite mesmerizing and the snow just kind of came up and cupped around those little lights, um, created a beautiful feeling and mood in the space. And I think, you know, in a playful way, it shone a light on the darkness of winter. Um, but again, you know, disrupting the space is an interesting thread with it, you know, taking um, essentially a formal park and um, playing with literally the entire extent of that, the art sort of completely reimagined that space and changed the whole mood and ambience. So that's the roundup. Um, so here we've got our, our 12 outstanding works again on the screen with a reminder. Um, and we might dive in and, and answer a question quickly um, before we round up. So um, the question we've got is the trends being discussed reflect 2017. What do you think the forecast for 2018 will be? Um, do we know who that question came from? It's an anonymous one. Okay, so good question. Yeah. Uh, forecasting. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it'll be, of course, Really interesting to see. I mean, I think that um, I think that a lot of the trends that we've identified are not isolated to 2017. 
I think they're things that have been sort of building, um, gaining momentum. Uh, I mean, some of the ideas like um, interactivity, immersive experiences, you know, uh, those are trends that have been so obviously, well, I mean, I think they have particularly sort of uh, become uh, more significant yeah. and, you know, certainly related to the, um, also the rise of the importance of social media, yeah. of people, you know, being able to uh, record and document an experience or an image that they can then share and uh, feel like they're participating and taking ownership of you know work in the public sphere. Um, so those are you know those are obviously major major trends that can continue. Um, I do think that um, this sort of uh, social engagement and, and political engagement is not going away anytime soon. I mean, we've also seen in the U.S. Um, obviously in, in recent months uh, the the Me Too movement and the sort of focus on um, women's rights and um, I think you know some of the um, issues that have taken a back seat. Um, are, are sort of, you know, taking a, a more prominent place and that that will inevitably affect how, you know, a number of artists are thinking and about how institutions are thinking yeah. as well. Definitely. And there is a, a stronger, I think, connection between what's happening in public space and what's happening in institutions as well, which, which is interesting. Um, I think the dialogue between the institutional space and the public art space is coming close together. Um, and also, I think um, it's interesting, we mentioned earlier, there is that trend that we're noticing around technology and those platforms like authentic reality. I don't think that necessarily this year we're going to see a whole lot of great artwork playing in that space, but I do think that that medium and that platform is going to be picked up more. And it's just interesting to watch that space. You know, there's lots of questions around virtual space, ownership of virtual space, which I think is an interesting area for public artists to play in and, and explore and, and test out, particularly in a politically engaged manner. So um, that's a really interesting area to watch, I think. Look, our next question was, has the role of public art changed and in what way? Um, and for example, public art is now seen as essential to cities, to urban spaces, um, and it's, it's something that is, you know, yeah. considered in public, new public development. Right. I mean, this is a question that we've been very conscious of mm -hmm. in the last year because we were looking at the 40-year history of public art fund from an organisation that began with a very civic kind of role. Um, and which has sort of moved more and more into a kind of art-driven role where um, really public art has become you know, one of the key aspects of the broader contemporary art discourse. Um, it's not like we have you know, public artists over in one camp and museum artists over in another, um, really, you know, this is a, a sort of a way that interesting artists, imaginative artists, ambitious artists can sort of take on the challenge of working in uh, urban space. And, you know, I think that it, certainly the field of public art has grown tremendously yeah, yeah. Um, for a whole lot of reasons. But I think it, it, it is something that. Um, has been recognized by a lot of cities around the world as contributing mm -hmm. tremendously to the vitality of the city. There's something also, uh, again, in this moment where public dialogue and the idea that artists play an important role and that their voices should be heard uh, in the public domain um, is 
you know, it, it is really significant and important value. But certainly, we believe it very strongly, and uh, that we want to advocate for. And, and I think a lot of people really care about. It. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and we've got a question now from Anna. Thank you, Anna. How do you measure the effectiveness of public art? Um, yeah. Um, it's interesting. It, that also has has changed yeah. in a way. I mean, one of the um, one of the big challenges for an organisation like ours has been knowing our audience. Yeah. Because when you present work in a public space, you know it's free. It's open to the public twenty four seven. Yeah. You're not taking tickets or checking people in at the door. Um, and also they don't know who you are. You know, they're seeing a work of art in public, but they don't necessarily know that the public art fund that sits here. Yeah. So how do we know the audience? It was really incredibly difficult, but with the advent of social media, um, that's given us an opportunity to use those platforms to engage with audiences so that people can you know, can follow us on different formats or can you know post their images um, and hashtag our project. They can get information from their phones about works that are in public space that would have been very hard to you know communicate about in different ways. So um, I think one way we might measure success would be that kind of uh, response on a social media level, um, which is really, you know, just a new metric. We've always had other metrics, so you might have critical response um, as one metric. You might have the art world response as another metric. Um, but now you can also gauge this kind of, um, you know, broader kind of social media engagement as Another metric. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it really is becoming a key viewing platform. You know, I think there are, are people experiencing the public artwork purely through their social platforms, which is really interesting to consider. Mm -hmm. You know, as an artist making artwork in a public space, that, that you might have a work that's only experienced by someone virtually. So even the kind of opposite of what we were talking about previously about the virtual yeah. world being a platform. Yeah. That you're viewing them. I mean, I think the, I think the good thing is that that is really increasing the audience. Mm. I don't think people are staying home because oh, they no. see it. They're you know, probably coming to the destination. Yeah, you know, if anything, it's happening for tourism, it's happening the frequency of right. location. But yeah. it doesn't mean that if you're living in, you know, Australia or South America yeah. or Africa or Asia, you know, you could look at public art fund project yeah. that you would not otherwise get to experience. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that's the end of our um, questions because of time. Um, there are some other questions and we will come back to you by email as promised. Um, but essentially, I think we're just going to wrap that up. Um, so, again, thank you everyone for joining in and thank you for hanging on when we had our technical issues at the start. And um, it's been a pleasure having you. We have had viewers from all around the globe, which is really fantastic and had a really, really great turnout. So we do thank you all. And I know it's different times of the day for you all and the night. So thanks for making time and for logging in. And um, for those of you who returned from our review last year, thanks for um, joining us again. And we do hope that you'll join us again for the next annual review. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for joining this conversation, for bringing so much incredible insight and um, thought and um, just really interesting information to the, the dialogue. It's, oh, it's fabulous. My pleasure. I really enjoyed the, the conversation. Thank you. And thank you for hosting us here as well. Yeah, it's pleasure. fantastic to be Quite. here at the Public Art Fund. Welcome anytime. <laughs> thank you. Well, from UAP and Public Art Fund, thank you very much. That was the top Public Art Project of 2020.